p.m. in Singapore's Level 3 DBS Asia Central. I'm Taimur Beg, Chief Economist at DBS Bank. Welcome to our March Macro Insights live stream. We're doing things a little differently this time. We're live on YouTube. We're also live on LinkedIn. And you can see on the screen a little QR code that tells you how you can ask us questions, which we will be monitoring later. And I say we because it's just not me. You're tru yours truly, I'm also going to be accompanied by Radhika Rao, Senior Economist, and Mati Ng, Senior Economist. We will be going through a series of issues, including on what's happening with Perils of Live TV. Some sound was creeping in, but I put that off. Uh, we will be going through the very latest on the Silicon Valley Bank bailout, which has been roiling the global markets for the last few days, including this past weekend. We'll talk to you about the latest on that and what we think of that in terms of global ramification for global macroeconomy. Uh, we will touch on a series of other issues. What's happening at Eurozone? What's happening in Japan? How are we looking at the supply chain situation? And of course, the title of this presentation, the resiliency in the global growth environment and the sticky inflation, which also has had a pretty profound impact on market pricing with respect to currencies, interest rates, as well as overall growth outlook. So let's get right to it. Start with the slides. So as I said earlier, the title of the presentation, Growth Resilience and Sticky Inflation. Here is the outline, and there is the QR code also. I will begin uh, global overview, SVB, inflation, growth globally, where we stand, market pricing for Fed, and so on. Radhika Rao will then come in and talk about the Eurozone area, where we also have had substantial lift up with respect to interest rate policy, and of course, the big shadow of the war in Ukraine. Ting Ma will then step in with Japan, its own adventure with respect to YCC and a new governor. Radhika will then come back and talk about India and ASEAN. Ting will return on supply chain, during which uh, period we hopefully will receive some interesting questions from you, QR code on the top end of the screen, and then we will conclude. So let's get to it. Um, global overview, where we stand with the SVB collapse. So as you know, Silicon Valley Bank was a mid-level bank in the US in terms of its uh, deposit base and its operation. Even till a few months ago, it was considered a fairly solid bank, but because it was not considered a large enough systemically important bank. It did not have the rigors of uh, Federal uh, Reserve stress testing, and therefore there were some uh, losses on its balance sheet, mismatch on its maturity structure that was propping up, uh, which was not necessarily very well captured by the markets till a couple of months ago. And that issue came to a head in the last uh, few weeks or so where uh, ratings downgrade fear, uh, the issue related to uh, the, the mark to market loss on their portfolio, some of it <laughs> held into what is known as hold to maturity account, but those things came up. And that story started having a rather negative impact on sentiment of depositors. So we saw a very large withdrawal of deposits over the last few weeks, uh, and that precipitated significant amount of concern from the regulators who looked at the books and basically shut the bank down last Friday. There was a lot of concern over the weekend about the numerous depositors who have over $200 billion worth of deposits at Silicon Valley Bank. When and how will they get their money back? Some of these are not individual depositors, but actual companies, largely startups in the Silicon Valley area. How will they meet payrolls? All that panic, in our perspective, will likely have been addressed by the very recent announcement just a few hours ago about the Fed stepping in. Uh, but before I get into the Fed facility that hopefully will backstop some of this risk, let's be very clear that while there's some risk of contagion, depositors worldwide are looking at this. They are worried about how much of their deposit is covered in various jurisdictions because it's not the same as the US as elsewhere. Uh, and also there is some fear that you know, mid-level banks, uh, if you are an investor into them, you may not be bailed out at all. So some degree of pressure on bank share prices, some degree of uh, capital outflow from investors who have uh, holdings in financial sector is likely. But I think we can safely say that overall financial system buffers, the policy tools that are available to regulators around the world are ample. We learned a lot in the 2008-2009 crisis what to do and what not to do. And what we saw 
uh, Sunday evening U.S. time, Monday morning our time, the kind of action the Federal Reserve and the Federal Deposit Insurance Company announced tells you that their actions are informed by the legacy of the global financial crisis. Don't worry about the investors. They got in knowing that it's a risky investment. They will likely be wiped out. But do worry about the depositors who may have problems running their businesses or running their livelihood if some of these deposits that are beyond the insurance cover were to be in jeopardy. Try to address that as quickly as possible. That's the way you deal with systemic risk. So bank term funding program, that's the uh, fund that's been announced. Um, uh, basically Sunday night, US time, Monday morning, Singapore time, BTFP. It will offer loans up to one year in duration to lenders who pledge as collateral US treasuries or agency debt, mortgage-backed securities, and they will be valued at par. That's the important part, that things that you held to maturity should not really be marked to market at a given point. That's the whole point of having a hold to maturity account, and that's what some of these financial institutions are doing. They still have run duration risk. They probably should have hedged the interest rate exposure. They didn't all that, do all that, but that doesn't mean that error should lead to huge cost on the part of depositors. It should mean cost on the part of investors, but not necessarily on the part of depositors. That's the playbook that the regulators are deploying right now. And just before we started the live stream, we heard that the UK unit of SVB has also been acquired by uh, HSBC for a nominal price, and they will then address taking care of depositors. Uh, my understanding is that there are hundreds of UK-based companies which also have their funds deposited with the UK unit of SVB. So bottom line, this is not a trivial matter. Hundreds of billions of dollars worth of deposits are at stake, but the workout is clear and transparently communicated by the authorities already. And overall, global financial system is still characterized by ample buffer. Uh, large banks are subject to rigorous stress tests. Their capital levels have not been as high in recent memory. Uh, hence, the risk of a global banking crisis, in our view, is extremely small. Uh, and the sort of reaction that we have seen in the last 24 hours from authorities uh, give us some degree of confidence that this will be managed. But there's a but. While financial systems are well supported, there are questions of a broader question, uh, issue, which is who in this world, not just banks, but non-bank financial institutions, uh, corporations, sovereigns, who out there also have large duration risk? Who has large number of long duration assets and as we speak, is taking substantial losses on their portfolio because interest rates have gone up a lot over the last 15 months? That question, has lingered through the course of 2022, spilling over to 23. And my view is that we've been very lucky that we haven't seen large duration risk materialization tripping up uh, companies, countries, non-financial and financial institutions. But that risk right now, I think, is again in the forefront of our minds. And our view is that investors and regulators worldwide would be asking far tougher questions to debtors around this going forward, having been chastened by what happened to SVV over the weekend. Now, normally when you have a lot of panic in the market, you see tightness in USD funding. Looking at the latest data of the last few days, no sign of that. We've had a sharp rise in interest rates over the last year or so, but as far as repo rate in the US market is concerned, things are well supported. When we look at funding conditions beyond the U.S. border, so I have on the screen right now three-month euro uh, basis uh, line, a line showing uh, yen basis, and in all those cases, the fact of the matter is there's only marginal evidence of liquidity tightening. I think there was some panic buying of gold and crypto on Friday. Our view is that that panic will subside as uh, markets open in Europe as we speak and U.S. in a few hours' time. Now, there's been a very dramatic repricing of Fed outlook all in the course of last week. We had to take note of our forecast early part of last week because the market had run well ahead of our view that there would be a 25 basis points rate hike in the March FOMC meeting after Ben Bernanke's testimony, uh, I'm sorry, not Ben Bernanke, missing a governor by a few generations, uh, by Jay Powell's testimony at the Congress on Tuesday and Wednesday. The market's view was forming around a 50 basis points rate hike, uh, but then we had somewhat moderating data as far as wage growth was concerned and not a blockbuster data as far as payrolls were concerned. The markets took that into account. We're still thinking about 50 basis points rate high, but by Friday, 
all those expectations have evaporated. As you can see in the chart that I have on the screen, the 2023 pricing has basically been revised dramatically in the last few days. The view is that the Fed not only is worrying about inflation, which is a substantial worry, and we'll look at that data and relevant information momentarily, but at the same time, high interest rates have a tendency of creating collateral damage. Sovereigns trip up, corporations trip up, sometimes banks trip up. The recent uh, spate of events around SVB and a few other banks would probably restrain the Fed from growing very aggressive on interest rate side, and that's the pricing we're seeing in the markets. So as I said earlier, that the midweek data that we got last, uh, in a few days ago, uh, show U.S. inflation related drivers, whether it's coming from the labor market, wages, uh, unemployment, or coming from the housing market rents, they're all showing some degree of moderation. They're still uncomfortably high. You don't want year after year of significantly ahead of inflation, uh, rent increases. You don't want wage growth to be substantial. And you do not want unemployment to be in such low territory that employers have to bid up wages to hire workers. That situation is still not disappeared. But at the same time, we're not seeing escalating risk the way we saw last year. So we are at a bit of an uncomfortable juxtaposition. Financial market instability requires degree of prudence and restraint on the Fed's part. Inflation not disappearing fast enough entails a degree of aggressiveness on the Fed's part. Balancing those are becoming far more challenging as we have bank-related stress as well as still sticky inflation. All right, inflation is sticky. We'll talk about that in a second. But what about growth? If you look at the data surprise lines, if you will, of the large eco economic blocks in the world, European Union, United States, China, uh, things are pretty hot. China, of course, the very strong reopening, and would have Ting probably touch on that a little bit later on, is doing um, adding a significant amount of offsets to any sort of doom and gloom we may have on the global landscape. But that doom and gloom is not being offset just by China. The U.S. data also is looking pretty good, and hence we are seeing substantially positive uh, accumulation of data surprises coming from the U.S. and China. Even Eurozone may not be as hot in terms of surprising on the upside as it was earlier, but still significantly better than anything we saw a year ago when there was a huge concern about recession and stagflation in the Eurozone. What about inflation? I can go through 100 charts, but I think this chart is probably most telling at the current juncture. The ISM manufacturing price index has declined substantially over the last one year, except for the last month when it ticked up again. So the disinflationary comfort that we have been getting for a while with oil topping out, with gas topping out, uh, with supply chains getting restored, we may have seen the best of it. Having said that, the inflation indicators like core inflation or headline inflation tend to be a lagging indicator of what the corporations are facing today. So if they have been facing declining input pressure for the last six months, this month's uptick still would entail several more months of disinflation coming from the core side. So as you can see in this chart, the black line leads the red line. It went up long before inflation picked up. It's come down a lot, and I would argue it hasn't fully fed through the inflation numbers. Hence, in the coming months, we will see core inflation go down from the four and a half handle that we have to the threes, may not be two, that's the big question for the Fed. We will not be resolving this today. We have to keep an eye on this much longer. All right, that's enough for me for the time being. We have a lot more room to cover. So I'm going to ask Radhika to come over. Hi, Radhika. Hi, Demur. And Eurozone for you. And then you can take it away and give it to uh, Tiang later on. Will do. Thank you so much. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so Demur covered uh, the hot topic now, which is SVB, uh, followed by an overview of the US economy. Uh, so what I'll follow up with will be uh, Europe, um, the Eurozone in particular, uh, and then Ting, my colleague, will come in and give you a view of Japan. Uh, so panning over to the slides, um, the next part, which is the outline slide, will give you my part, which is Europe. Uh, so let me go to that. Um, starting off with U.S. confidence, uh, EU confidence. Uh, of course, um, you know, the, uh, Temur did mention he shared the upside surprises as a surprise index uh, in terms of data. And what we have seen in Europe is that uh, last year, 2022, was a year, uh, rather difficult year. Uh, we had a big geopolitical event which had led to energy prices as well as in broader commodity group rally quite sharply. And I think no other country or, or region felt the heat as much as Europe did. 
Uh, but, the, but the end of the year, um, you know, understandably, there were worries that because of gas prices that had gone up and other commodity prices that had gone up, that the uh, region would actually feel uh, acute pain and there was a big recession risk uh, or recession overhang um, on Europe. Uh, but what happened to us late last year is that we actually saw some upside surprises. We saw, um, you know, relief by way of stepped up fiscal support by the government, uh, by various national governments. Uh, we also saw, uh, you know, recession rec recede because we saw the labor market is actually doing quite well, uh, somewhat similar to what's happening in the U.S. Uh, so in this slide, we show you the sentiment indices. And what you can see is that kind of uh, third quarter of last year, a bit of a bottoming out. Uh, in not only current expectations, but also uh, forward-looking uh, gauge. Uh, and that's true of uh, you know, uh, business uh, indices, sentiment indices, as well as growth-related. Uh, and on the economic sentiment versus GDP, it tends to track this um, gauge quite closely. And because of the black line that you see on the left bottom, uh, you can see that there's been a fairly close uh, you know, correlation between these two gauge. And with this black line picking up, we do think that the growth number as well uh, will show a bit of uh, bottoming out towards late last year, early 2023. Um, and if when you see the growth numbers overall, that happened as well because uh, Europe was or Eurozone was expected to um, you know, end a recession late last year, but growth in the revised number shows that it narrowly skirted uh, you know, a, a reduction in output. Uh, and one of the offshoots is that the labor markets generally have been quite buoyant. You've seen the unemployment rate um, being in a multi-year low. You've also seen you know, vacancy rates uh, picking up. Uh, and uh, the second derivative is basically wage growth. Of course, inflation has been running very hot, and we'll come to that in a bit. Uh, but what is happening because of high inflation is that some of that effect is seeping into wage growth as well. Uh, now, while when you, when you talk about nominal wage growth, the cup hasn't been very strong or as much as the inflation number. But what you see as a negotiated wage growth, which is basically pipeline risk, those are certainly rising. Uh, and what you see is that uh, last year itself, statutory minimum wages um, across the region, particularly Eastern Europe, um, European countries, adjusted um, you know, quite strongly. You also have various unions uh, running with a wage um, indexation or inflation indexation for wage growth. Basically, you, know, you, you adjust to inflation in terms of the nominal numbers. Uh, so that's underway as well. So some of that has been passed through. Some of that is still being uh, negotiated. Uh, nonetheless, you see that there is still some pass through coming through. And taking that to the inflation bit, um, that kind of you know, sinks up, right? You've seen inflation, goods inflation, which is much more to do with gas prices. Uh, now, what happened in gas prices is that late last year, uh, there was a worry that uh, there were, uh, you know, Europe, um, some of the bigger countries would actually face an energy shock, particularly Germany. But as we came into October, November, um, surprisingly, the buffer stocks um, you know, were much better than what has been in the past. You also saw a late onset of winter. Uh, so in a way, demand was pushed back a bit. Uh, culmination of these factors saw gas prices come off highs. Uh, so that provided relief to these imported price pressures. But as I shared with you in the earlier slide, um, you have seen wage growth, which is still you know, passing through. You have seen service sector as well still adjusting. So while headline inflation has come off highs, you do see core inflation actually still at record levels. For example, in February, it was at 5.6%, um, you know, very high by Europe's uh, standards. So that's why you've seen inflation expectations prove to be quite sticky, despite imported uh, price pressures uh, coming off. Uh, so what that means for ECB, and ECB meets later this week, uh, and uh, just as a, you know, we have provided a stress indicator here just to show you that if uh, you, you take a culmination of, of uh, you know, the FX, piece, the money markets, as well as the rates, uh, the stress is not as high uh, in the local or the domestic financial system. Nonetheless, rates are still going up. And as a, a counterparty that, it will be ECB projections. The March numbers will be provided later this week. Uh, and what happened in December and September when the last quarterly numbers were presented uh, was that you saw growth being revised down and inflation being revised up. We do think this will again play out uh, when we meet, when the ECB meets later this week. Uh, and that will be basically uh, uh, setting the stage for further ECB uh, rate action. Uh, so, sorry about that. Let me just go back. Okay, so uh, what we expect, we expect the ECB, and I think it's a well telegraphed hike. Um, the ECB has been talking about a 50 basis point hike um, you know, in March, uh, and we do think that will occur. 
Uh, of course, there are some risk events that are developing at, at least uh, across the Atlantic in the US, but I don't think that will really deter the ECB for the time being. Um, what will happen beyond March, I think, is the bigger question mark. Will, will they go for more hikes? Uh, we have a 25 basis point beyond March um, penciled in, uh, but we do think that uh, there's a bit of an upside uh, risk to that um, to, the, uh, to a rate call, depending on how inflation uh, really pans out. Uh, so as of now, we see room for about 75 basis point more hikes uh, from, you know, uh, from now on for the rest of the year. Uh, and the last bit on the fiscal fiscal bit is that uh, you know the, the, the fiscal thresholds, uh, which is has statutory ones, have been kind of uh, uh, you know relaxed because of the pandemic, and now the European Commission has been talking about bringing it back on in 2024, which does mean that uh, many of the countries will have to tighten their purse after providing a lot of fiscal support for the crisis as well as the pandemic. Um, but I think there's going to be some difference in that mechanism, but because they're not going to make it one size fits it all, I think every country uh, might be given a different timeline to try and narrow or consolidate finances. Uh, so that brings me to the end of uh, Europe. Uh, now on to Japan. I'll uh, get teeing in, and then we, I'll be back in later for the next part, I think. Thanks, Radhika. So after Europe, we will move on to Japan. For Japan, there is a lot of interest recently because of the um, change of uh, BOJ governor and also the expectation for monetary policy normalization. Um, so we, firstly, we'll take a look at the uh, economic performance in Japan, and later we will also touch on monetary policy. Economic front, we see that uh, GDP growth remains uh, resilient. The OECD's uh, GDP growth tracker for Japan shows that uh, uh, economy is growing around uh, 1% in first quarter of this year. So whole year, it should also be on track to achieve about 1% growth. The economy had 4% contraction in 2020 during the pandemic. So after three years of around 1%, 1 1.5% 1 uh, growth, Japan economy will basically return to the levels before the pandemic by the end of this year. Manufacturing sector in Japan, in fact, is contracting because of the uh, downturn in global trade cycle. But if you look at the services sector indicators, like services PMI, they are doing quite well. That is partially due to the uh, recovery in domestic consumption activities after COVID, and partially also due to the uh, opening of the borders to uh, international travelers. On the inflation side, we see inflation pressure in Japan is high. Inflation is overshooting the BOJ's 2% uh, targets. The latest CPI inflation numbers for Tokyo uh, already released last week. It showed that uh, headline CPI uh, come down a little bit from the peak of uh, 4% to about 3.5% in February. But the core core CPI, excluding fresh food and energy, continue to uh, rise and starting to converge with uh, headline CPI, also close to 3.5%. The BOJ's estimate also shows that the percentage of uh, uh, price items uh, with a price increase is much higher than the percentage of items with a price decrease. It's 80% uh, versus 13%. Uh, so the diffusion index uh, is far higher than 50%. Inflation expectations have been going up as well. The Tenkan survey it shows that the Japanese companies they are currently expecting more than 2% inflation for the next one year, three year, and also five year horizon. As inflation pressure is high, and meanwhile, uh, economic performance remains re resilient, Naturally, uh, there is expectation for interest rates to go up in Japan. So over the past one year, we saw the 10-year uh, OIS rate has been traded higher than the 10-year uh, GDP yield, uh, showing that uh, financial markets, in fact, have been expecting uh, rich hacks in Japan. And the gap between these two indicators is now as wide as uh, 30 basic points. Foreign investors have also been uh, massively selling uh, Japanese government bonds because of expectation for higher interest rates. If we look at foreign net investment in Japan bonds, it has turned negative over the past one year, uh, including several uh, periods of uh, intense uh, sell off in 2Q last year, 4Q last year, and also uh, the recent first quarter of this year. As investors uh, sold JGB's uh, BOJ had to increase its uh, bond purchases 
to contain the rise in uh, JGB yields. So BOG's holdings of uh, JGBs have increased notably over the past one year, uh, reaching close to uh, 600 trillion Japanese yen. That is more than 50% of the total outstanding amount of JGBs. On monetary policy, because of the um, market pressure and also because uh, economic performance uh, is resilient, we see the Bank of Japan has been making some uh, modification of its uh, year curve control uh, YCC policy framework. It's widened the 10-year yield trading band by 25 uh, basis points at the December meeting. And going forward, we think the BOGM will further modify YCC uh, in second quarter this year. It could be another widening of the 10-year yield band by 25 basis points. It could also be uh, changing of the um, long-term uh, interest target from 10-year yield to uh, five-year yield. This kind of uh, modification measures, they don't require overhaul of the uh, YCC policy framework, and they will not trigger uh, drastic uh, reaction in the financial markets. At the same time, they may have to improve uh, the liquidity conditions in the GDP market and also reduce the uh, distortion of the GDP yield curve, basically to rectify some of the operational issues uh, in the bond market. In terms of the substantial policy changes, YCC exit, uh, that will be a long process. YCC exit refers to uh, lifting the cap on the 10-year yield allowing the uh, long-term rates to be determined by market factors. It also refers to ending of the negative rate policy, reading the short-term policy rate into the positive territory. And finally, BOJ also needs to unwind asset purchases, unwind its uh, QQE program. To exit from YCC, uh, that will require a stable 2% uh, inflation. Although the current CPI numbers are, are higher than 2%, it does not mean a stable 2% uh, inflation has been achieved. If we look at the demand side uh, drivers for, for inflation uh, in, in Japan, now we can see that uh, these indicators remain relatively weak. Wage growth, for example, is still running at uh, uh, 1%, not enough to generate 2% uh, inflation on a sustainable basis. If a stable 2% inflation cannot be achieved, the BOJ will have to uh, revise its uh, inflation commitment. Doing that, however, may um, also uh, carry some risks. It may reduce uh, policy transparency and also weaken the uh, BOJ's uh, credibility. Additional challenge for YCC exceeds will also include rapid rise in JGB yields, increasing uh, Japan's uh, public debt repayment burdens. Uh, Japan's uh, public debt is uh, highest in the world. It's more than 250% of GDP. Another challenge is uh, uh, sharp um, fluctuation in the exchange rate market. There is a very tight correlation between uh, USD JPY interest differential and uh, exchange rates. So rapid rise in JGB yields could also trigger a uh, sharp rise in the yen exchange rate. Okay, so uh, to summarize, I think YCC exceeds these substantial uh, policy changes it will take some quite, quite some time to uh, materialize, and uh, policymakers will also have to adopt a very careful, cautious approach. Okay, so this is um, what I have for Japan. I think I will pass this back to Radhika. This will be about the emerging market outlook in Asia. Thank you so much, Ding. Uh, we are taking you quite on a worldwide tour, um, so let me uh, bring in India and ASEAN and just going to be an overview. Uh, we are happy to take your questions uh, as in the QR code that you can see on the screen. Uh, please do put in any questions across the different regions that we have covered or anything that is top of mind uh, for you at this point. Uh, so digging back to the outline, I'll give you, uh, share a, a brief snapshot on India in terms of the momentum growth wise and then inflation and a similar thing for ASEAN. Uh, and then thing will come back in uh, giving you uh, sharing some of the supply chain dynamics. Uh, that are relevant at this point. Uh, so in terms of the activity snapshots, so the GDP data that came out uh, with quite a lag, this is the uh, last quarter of 2022. Um, and what you did see is that uh, growth at the headline level decelerated, uh, which is largely expected because of base effects. Um, and also what you did see is that past two years of GDP numbers were revised on the annual as well as quarterly numbers. Uh, so it kind of changed the base a little bit as well. 
Uh, nonetheless, the main, uh, you know, the uh, component wise, uh, if you see most of the segments, including consumption as well as the expenditure type breakdown has gone past uh, the pre pandemic levels. So it's uh, varying between, you know, 4% to 25%, 30%. There has been an improvement across the board. And here I compare it with the December uh, 2019 levels. Uh, when I look at some of the high frequency prints uh, that are coming out, um, you do see that a bit of a variation. Um, and you see numbers like PMI certainly much more uh, in the expansionary that is above 50 uh, mark. Um, if you look at the, some of the uh, say things like retail sales or things like uh, uh, you know motor vehicle sales, registration, uh, GST, which is the indirect tax collection, all of that is showing buoyancy coming into uh, the new year in 2023. Um, employment benefits, basically when the economy restarted last year, uh, you did see a reopening boost, um, you know, resumption in services, particularly that also passed on some of the employment benefits to the, uh, to the labor markets, and that is uh, still playing out uh, coming into uh, 2023. Uh, but of course, some of the one-off idiosyncratic factors which happened during the pandemic, number one being savings rate. Uh, you know, went up quite sharply or savings went up quite sharply. Now that has beginning to be run down. So when I see the latest update, uh, certainly savings uh, have come down. And at the same time, you also seen credit growth pick up. Uh, so I think the story between 22 and 23 is going to be more of moderation, normalization in the year that we are going into. Uh, that's going to be visible at the, uh, you know, high frequency data level. And we do think that's going to be visible at the growth level as well. Um, so. Uh, we have a you know GDP now casting model that some of you might be already familiar with. We run this exercise for a few countries in the region, including India. Uh, and before the quarter is on us, um, using some of the st uh, statistically important indicators, we can give you an idea of what the GDP number is going to look like. And what it's telling us at this point is that for the March 23 quarter, uh, we are about uh, in the low 4% handle uh, for the um, you know year on year growth. Um, Coming to the inflation dynamics, um, you know, sticking with, with the theme of uh, today's discussion, uh, in India, inflation and inflation-related issues are not new. Uh, in fact, through the pandemic, while many of the Asian countries were in midst of uh, deflation, you know, this disinflation, you had inflation actually below targets. Um, in India, inflation was consistently on the stronger end of the inflation uh, range, a target range, which is 2 to 6%. Uh, various reasons, I mean, you had supply shocks, uh, you had some of the, co and since then, input costs by companies also being passed on uh, to the final consumer. And more recently, it, it is about, um, you know, what's happening in the food inflation um, arena. Now, particularly for this, I think this is relevant for growth as well. Uh, one of the things that is developing now is that, you know, weather conditions are certainly uh, very important when it comes to food output, uh, farm output. Uh, and uh, the local uh, weather agency has basically mentioned that uh, the next three months you could see, in fact, uh, high temperatures in March already that's playing out um, on the ground. You've seen temperatures being much higher, risk of heat waves, and that followed by onset of an El Nino. Uh, and in uh, uh, the upcoming monsoon, which uh, takes place around June, July, is a very crucial monsoon period for India because the summer crop is sown then and harvested three, four months later. So any inclement weather during or temperamental weather around that time certainly has an effect on the sowing activity as well as on the uh, you know, harvesting. At this point, uh, thankfully, you've seen uh, you know, enough moisture on the ground. You have seen that more than 50% of the irrigated land already has, um, uh, you know, has irrigation facilities. Uh, but nonetheless, weather, I think, and the turn thereof will be very important, not only for inflation, but will be uh, important for farm output as well, and particularly the sector because it employs uh, close to about 40-45% of the population. So coming back to inflation, certainly on the higher, still on the higher end of the target, um, and we think that that will be one of the reasons why uh, you can see in these charts uh, that the weather woes are basically uh, you know, trickling down to some of the cereals as well, and certainly these make a big, big part or a big part in in um, the food basket. So overall, um, we do think supply shocks uh, are continuing to play out, uh, which is uh, particularly from the food segment. Otherwise, in the core as well, you can see core readings and core core as we show in this chart is still again quite sticky. Uh, in all, then for the central bank, inflation remains um, you know front and center in terms of their priorities. We do think that the upcoming meeting 
uh, in April is going to be uh, another uh, 25 basis point hike. Uh, but thereafter, we think that the central bank, um, you know, the monetary policy committee is a bit going to become a bit divided uh, on the path ahead uh, because uh, supply shock by nature cannot be dealt alone by monetary policy. We will have to see some, uh, you know, support from the government as well in terms of administrative pressure um, measures or some fiscal support if required. Uh, so that would be the path ahead for India and the monetary policy. Uh, let me then quickly shift gears to ASEAN, uh, and we obviously covered this uh, with my colleague um, Han Teng. So, uh, what we take off this um, uh, ASEAN six space is that here too we see PMI indices are largely holding up for most of the economies, barring one or two. It's still holding up above that 50 mark, which is a kind of a line of expansion. Um, the other thing is that there is a distinction being between how the trade cycle. In, in this part of the world is doing vis-a-vis -vis how domestic demand is doing. So domestic demand is holding up okay, you know, when you see last year's one-off effects from the pandemic are certainly behind us. Uh, but there is some remnant benefit that's still flowing through. But the trade cycle is certainly, um, you know, exposed to what's happening globally. Uh, and from that angle, uh, as well as, you know, some segments demand slowing down, particularly electronics, you can see that, um, you know, growth, export growth is generally moderating. Uh, almost across the board. Uh, Barring Indonesia had um, seen you know, commodity prices being higher last year, came in very handy, but that too because of base effects uh, as well as commodities correcting since then um, is playing on uh, you know, the, the export growth numbers. And finally on the activity snapshot, uh, one big change which has happened in the past two, three months is China's reopening. Uh, thankfully it looks like a one-way street which is basically um, you know that the reopening continues and is, is almost complete. Uh, perhaps some of the other um, you know, airlines and all of those uh, frequency needs to be restored, but otherwise it's almost business as usual. Uh, and that certainly helps this part of the region uh, because in terms of uh, trade, in terms of investment, as, as well as in terms of tourism, there are strong linkages between ASEAN 6 as well as China. Uh, here we show you the tourism bit and what you see is that um, China, tourists from China do make a substantial part of arrivals, particularly for countries like Thailand. Uh, so reopening their you know, um, uh, reinstatement of all the flights, uh, taking out all the test requirements, have seen tourists come back uh, to this part of the world and that being beneficial for tourism revenues as well as growth overall. Uh, then that takes me to ASEAN 6 inflation. Um, just, uh, you know, they like what's happening in other parts of the world. Inflation is coming down, but not as fast as expected. And it, of course, varies between the countries. And one country that stands out here is certainly Philippines. Um, Philippines inflation is still in the 8% handle, uh, very high. And uh, that's why we have seen the central bank as well, uh, still eager or still signaling uh, the need for more rate hikes. Uh, and, uh, why, you know, besides inflation, which of course matters a lot, uh, these central banks are also looking at what the Fed is saying and doing. Of course, the pricing, as Temur mentioned, has fluctuated a lot in the past um, past few days. Uh, but if the Fed does come out, um, you know, uh, later this month, signaling that yes, they are still on course to go ahead and hike some more, uh, these central banks will watch for what that means for the yields, what that means for the U.S. dollar, whether the respective currencies come under pressure and that might dictate a bit of movement in the very near term. But otherwise, I think going into the second half of the year, uh, we would anticipate most of the central banks to dial down their rate hikes and enter a pause. Uh, this pretty much brings me to the end of uh, ASEAN uh, overview. I'll pass it back to Ting for a supply chain update. Thanks very much, Radhika. So in the last part of the presentation, we're going to take a, take a look at the supply chain and also uh, North Asia. Well, uh, the trade data for January, February in North Asian countries have just been released uh, last week. And based on this latest data, we see that uh, the supply chain performers, uh, trade performers, uh, in fact, uh, diverges across uh, different markets. So China's uh, exports uh, showed a notable improvement in January, February. The decline narrowed to uh, minus 6.8%. That compared to uh, about minus 10% in December last year. But other countries, um, Korea, Taiwan, their exports uh, continue to decline sharply at an even faster pace compared to uh, December. 
the improvement in China's export data should be due to some country-specific factors. That is about China's uh, supply chain recovery after COVID, after reopening. Uh, if we look at the uh, China manufacturing PMI breakdown, then we can see that the supply side indicators, in fact, are doing quite well, uh, like the production uh, indicator and supplier's uh, delivery time index. They both uh, improved uh, quite sharply in February. Demand side, uh, demand side seems to be relatively weak compared to supply side. China's uh, uh, reopening demand is more about uh, services uh, than uh, manufacturing. So if you look at uh, China's uh, uh, imports, goods imports, in fact, uh, they continue to fall uh, sharply January, February. And Korea Taiwan's exports to China also continue to contract uh, very sharply uh, in the first two months of this year. So basically, um, China's reopening is, has not yet started to uh, benefit the rest of Asia through the uh, trade channel. And another phenomenon is that the uh, trade performance also diverges across uh, different industries. Uh, we select some of the important industries like automobile, uh, electronics, semiconductors. Then we can see that uh, automobile sector is doing relatively well. Uh, this sector, in fact, has emerged out of the pandemic ever since uh, 2021. Uh, there was some temporary slowdown in second half 21 and first half uh, 22. That was due to the supply chain disruption as a result of the uh, COVID-related uh, lockdowns, like the uh, lockdown in China, Shanghai last year. But starting from the second half of 2022, uh, it seems that the automobile sector has regained uh, some growth momentum. That should be partially due to the easing of uh, supply chain pressures and partially also due to still resilient demand in the auto sector that could be related to the uh, EV demand, the adoption of uh, new energy cars. The electronic sector, semiconductor sector, uh, is showing a very different pattern. Uh, if we look at uh, semiconductor exports uh, from China, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, they continue to fall very sharply in recent months, and the decline in fact uh, uh, even widened compared to in Q4 last year. This sector, semiconductor sector, in fact, uh, from 2020 to 2022, it maintained a very strong performance, three years of uh, strong performance. That was due to the pandemic-related demand for electronics devices. So the semiconductor sector was actually a beneficiary sector uh, from the pandemic. But now with the pandemic coming to an end, we see the uh, lockdown-related uh, electronics uh, demand started to disappear. And at the same time, the, the high inflation, high interest environment started to restrict uh, global consumers' uh, uh, spending power on durable goods, including e uh, electronics. Another thing is that the uh, US-China tech tensions uh, further escalated over the past one quarter. Uh, the U.S. further uh, widened the export controls on semiconductor sales to, to China. So this explains why the semiconductor sector started to see uh, deep declines. Currently, the inventory destocking pressure in the semiconductor sector is uh, pretty uh, serious. If we look at the indicators in Taiwan, uh, which is a major um, uh, uh, producer of uh, uh, semiconductors, then we can see that the inventory ratio in Taiwan's uh, electronic component sector is now as high as uh, two times. That is similar as the level during the 2008 global financial crisis and 2001 global tech bubble burst. So it will take quite some time for the um, inventory destocking to be completed in the semiconductor sector this time. It should be um, more than the typical cycle of uh, two quarters. We reckon that it may take uh, three to four quarters for inventory destocking to be completed this time, which means uh, um, perhaps we need to wait here at the end of this year to see a meaningful rebound in the global tech cycle. Okay, so this is all I have for supply chain in North Asia. Uh, I think I will pass it back to Taimo for the Q&A questions. Thank you very much, Tiying. Uh, we've covered a lot of room. Let's put the QR code. Okay, actually, we have the QR code on the screen already. Uh, request everybody who's attending to uh, scan the QR code and send in questions. We have quite a few. And I will activate one.
which I believe should be relevant for Ting. Ting, are we entering a supply glut in the electronic sector? Yes, uh, for the short term, I think so. As I uh, showed during the slide, the inventory ratio in Taiwan's semiconductor is pretty high. So in the short term, we have the oversupply issue in the electronic sector, especially semiconductor. That is partially due to one, it's the falling demand. And another is also the massive investment into the global semiconductor over the past three years. That translated into high capacity in this sector as well. Um, but for the medium to long term, I think the demand outlook in this sector remains uh, resilient and constructive um, because there is uh, still a rising adoption of the new technologies like AI, IoT, electrical cars, which requires large amounts of uh, semiconductor components. So for 2024 and beyond, I think the outlook remains constructive. What about the EV space you just mentioned? Mm -hmm. So what about batteries and electric cars themselves? Are we going to see a supply glut as the GLEs and the BYDs go after Tesla? And then we would see a price crash around that too? Uh, that part, I'm not so sure. Um, but I think um, the one important fact is that the EV battery uh, and also the EV car production, in fact, uh, it requires uh, two times of the uh, com semiconductor components mm. compared to the conventional cars. So it could remain uh, as a very important driver for the semiconductor demand in the medium to long term. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Radhika, I'm going to put a question up on the screen that uh, you may find interesting. Uh, with China's reopening, will China plus one strategy lose fizzle? Uh, well, I think we tend to see a lot of positives from China's reopening, uh, and I think that's an interesting question. Um, our take is that uh, China plus one strategy is here to stay. Now, I think it wasn't so much to do with just China's closure and reopening. Uh, I think the pandemic has kind of shown us that uh, more than just in time, it needs to be just in case. Uh, in terms of supply chains, you need to have multiple presence. Uh, I think it used to be go to the cheapest source. Now it is keep the cheapest source in view and also have uh, some other alternatives. And I think, as Ting had mentioned, uh, the, uh, I would think electronics is one of the sectors where there's been a considerable amount of movement, um, in particularly when it comes to, say, Apple supply chain, some of that has moved towards India. Not so much a manufacturing 101, but at least the ATMP, as we call right. it, which is assembly testing. More and more of that is heading into India. Uh, TSMC, which is another sub semiconductor, um, you know, uh, the major semiconductor player in this part of the world, is going closer to its uh, customer base. It's going to Europe, it's going to Japan, it's going to the US as well. Uh, so a lot of changes happening, and I don't think it is so much to do with just China's reopening. And EV is another, just to jump into the previous question. Uh, so in EV, what we've also seen is that some parts of the region, and Indonesia particularly, is trying to attract uh, EV battery makers into the region. Um, and it's wooing Tesla, and Tesla is also said to be looking at Malaysia, it's looking at a few other countries in this, in this part of the region. Yeah. I'm curious about this issue, both the question that Ting answered and the one that you answered. In terms of inflation, if we're going to have a lot of places which will make the same thing, so then they will crowd out the market for raw material, and that would be inflationary. But the end product, there'll be much more of that, and that should be disinflationary. Does that mean that all this industrial policy would lead to huge loss-making industries around the world because everybody's trying to vote for resiliency and they'll end up getting a lot of losses? So if um, I just start and probably think and uh, join in. Uh, I don't think uh, manufacturers are going in um, blind. I think it's still a function of wage growth, wage levels in that particular country, uh, existing strengths in terms of manufacturing. I, I just spoke about Indonesia and their EV battery makers are going in because of um, availability of raw material, nickel one, really and yes, absolutely. Yes. So I think that there is some method in the madness in terms of seeking alternate sources. But so the bigger offshoot, I would think, would be inflation while it comes down because of base effects and fluctuates a bit. But looking at the next five year or seven year horizon, uh, we do think that inflation structurally uh, would be higher than where we were, say, five, perhaps five, six years back. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Um, Ting, I want to go back to you. There was a question related to the inventory to shipment ratio chart. Uh, 
what is the current in inventory status of the semiconductor industry and what do you see in terms of outlook? You've touched on some of this already, but if you can one yeah, more time. Yeah, I already mentioned that a bit. So uh, to be very brief, uh, I think the inventory to shipment ratio uh, is uh, much higher than the historical average level. Uh, so it will take uh, some time for the destocking process to be uh, completed. Well, the typical cycle for inventory destocking in the semiconductor sector is uh, two, for two quarters. But this time, we think it will be much longer than that. It will be at least three quarters. So we need to wait at, at least here, maybe September, October this year, to see some uh, clearing of the inventory. Very well, very well. Um, Radhika, back to you. Um, food, you talked about this a little bit, and the seasonality aspect. Uh, the question is, um, in India, food is a short season crop, has been held as a transient factor in the past, given monetary policy works with a lag. Will it be the case this time as well? Certainly, I think this is uh, an important question, and I'm sure the policymakers are also uh, a bit worried about that because uh, they are an inflation targeting central bank. Uh, they do want to take inflation back, which is at about six, six and a half percent at this point. Uh, they want to take it down uh, at least into the range first, and then closer to four percent um, over the next, uh, uh, you know, twelve months. Uh, but if that these worries about food inflation does play out. Uh, I think at best what the central bank would do would be to hike rates once more in April and keep on hold. Um, while they, it can't address supply side shocks, I think inflationary expectations route would be something that they'd be paying close attention to. So maintain a hawkish bias, uh, keep rates on hold would be the, the way forward rather than hike some more. Uh, but certainly, I think uh, we have seen that play out in the food shortage issue. Not shortage so much as um, you know anticipation of uh, shortage uh, because of um, inclement weather uh, is something that's feeding through, and, and it's most obvious now in cereals, uh, especially wheat, uh, and um, what the monsoon that we are going into is is uh, a crucial one uh, because bulk of the um, food grains are grown then. So I'm curious. Are inflation expectations, A, adaptive in India, and B, largely driven by food? So my question is, if you have a bad harvest last year, you should think of that as a one-off, and you should not necessarily affect your inflation expectation. But is there a risk that even inflation expectation around these, what we think of as one-off weather events, still have an impact on expectations? Certainly. I think, the, um, so in inflation expectations, what you do see as a thumb rule in India's case particularly is not so much the absolute level, because absolute level seems is always way above where the right. actual levels are. So you tend to pay an attention to the incre incremental change. Uh, and that does move, uh, it adapts to say, you know, higher energy prices, um, you know, what happened in the past year, and it also tends to adapt to uh, seasonality in food as well. And particularly, I think, because when you're out there in the market and you're buying, say, food grains, you're buying vegetables, you're buying milk, so protein source is another one which has also shown a bit of buoyancy. I think it's passed through of higher fertilizer prices. So a lot of segments are getting affected, um, and I do think that uh, it will show a bit of effect. Uh, it's not so much based effect driven. Um, so I, I, so by, I think from the central bank's front, they can only do so much, of course, when it comes to supply shocks. I would really expect, I think, the uh, government uh, support to, to come in uh, by way of um, you know, either trying to do some administrative prices to bring down uh, some of the prices. Yeah. All right, Radhika and Ting, you've answered lots of questions very patiently. Thank you very much. I'll take the last five minutes and go to the screen with these things. Thank you, guys. All right, um, question. Uh, the most voted question, at what point this year can we expect central banks around the globe to reduce their hawkish approach? By the middle of this year, <laughs> I, we think. Um, we think that the way the inflation trajectory is panning out right now, assuming there is no major upside risk to food and fuel inflation around the crisis in Ukraine or some sort of a crop failure risk, if we put those two risks aside, uh, we are going to see between base effect and stability of food and fuel, fuel prices substantial disinflation starting from the second quarter of this year. So even if the Fed were to hike one or two more times in the second quarter, there will be ample room for headline inflation to fall from five to four to three, maybe not down to two, which is the reason we don't think the Fed will cut any time. But in terms of peak of inflation and interest rate, that is quite visible independent of recent rhetoric coming from Chair Jay Powell that they might have to hike a few more times, that is on the margin. The market, as you can see from the shape of the yield curve, which is deeply inverted, is expecting Fed funds to top out in the five, five and a quarter handle 
give and take 25 basis points. And then the big question for 24 would be, when would interest rate cuts happen? Um, related question, uh, not that different from what I just discussed, is what's the chance of Fed funds rate going to 6% in the second quarter? Not a lot, especially after what happened over the last few days with SVB and all the fear of financial market stability around high interest rates. So inflation fighting is very important. The Fed wants to establish its credential. It will hike in March and it will hike further in the second quarter. We think that is likely, but to take it from where we are, sub five, all the way to 6%, another 125 basis points in the cycle, we think that's very, very unlikely. The US economy is showing some degree of resiliency. The Chinese economy is picking up. But by and large, globally, demand side inflation is not the problem. The problem has been supply side. And that is getting ameliorated through supply chain normalization and increase in energy production. So let's not get too worried about the inflation outlook and start expecting extremely high interest rates. I think sub six, more like five and a half or five and a quarter is where this cycle would end. Fingers crossed, we don't want much higher. Um, I'm sort of uh, panning through the questions. Um, okay, so this question, I think both Radhika and I both could have answered, but since Radhika has left the stage, I will take it on. Um, will you agree that EU's market strongest influencing factor is energy and US's market strongest influencing factor is the labor market? I think the answer would have been yes on Friday, but no longer. It is clear that a financial instability risk even outweighs the labor market risk, because that is very discreet. That can create risks around contagion, risk around massive uh, global uh, transmission of risk, whereas with respect to the labor market, it's a monthly data point. It is fairly strong. Wages are sort of in the four or five handle, not too low, but not exactly devastatingly worrisome as far as the Federal Reserve is concerned. So over the longer handle, yes, you do focus on labor market because it's part of the Fed's mandate. Uh, and in Europe, of course, the vulnerability of energy is substantial. Last year certainly was an issue. But that's not the only factor or the most important factor all the time. It's time varying, as we have seen in the last 48 hours. Um, OK, more question on SVB. With Signature Bank falling after SVB, how can we better prepare ourselves for a potential contagion? I think we're already doing that, uh, setting up special purpose vehicles with funds in which uh, banks, mid-sized banks, which are not fully covered under existing regulation of stress tests, can bring their hold to maturity portfolio, sell their assets at par, and use that to fund themselves, which itself was the risk that uh, manifested and tripped up Silicon Valley Bank last week. So we would think that the existence and introduction of this facility alone would be a very big mitigation of systemic risk in the system. That doesn't mean, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, that banks, non-bank financial institutions, corporates, and sovereigns, that across these four large entities in the world, that more risks do not lurk. It probably does. High interest rate cycle always almost always come with some degree of uh, contagion, some degree of financial instability. We have been fairly lucky, except for a few frontier market economies over the last 12, 15 months, not too much collateral damage so far around the high interest rates. We've absorbed it pretty well. But as you can see from this example, if you, were long, uh, if you had a lot of long bonds on your portfolio, you did not hedge that interest rate risk, you will be taking a lot of loss. In the case of a financial institution with short-term deposits and long-term loans, that's an inherent risk. And I, I would be surprised if some of those risks were to materialize. But that doesn't mean there is a risk at a systemic level. It's episodic, uh, balance sheet specific. Um, just a couple of minutes left. Uh, oh, I, I love this question. Uh, has the Fed ever engineered a soft landing in recent history? And the answer is yes, depending on, of course, you know, what your definition of recent history is. We've only had two recessions in the last 15 years, so recent history has to be longer than that, let's say 30 years, okay? In the mid-90s, under uh, Alan Greenspan, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates all the way to 6%. There was some collateral damage. We had the 1994 tequila crisis in Mexico because of high interest rates, but the U.S. economy did not feel it. It just slowed a tad did not go into a recession. And these were the you know, very good Clinton years when central bankers were the superstars in the world. And there was certainly a very well-engineered soft landing. 
I would also argue that the depth and duration of the recession of the early 90s as well as in the early 2000s were so short that maybe it still technically qualifies as a hard landing because there was an actual recession. But in terms of you know, totality of job loss or financial failure or overall pain to the population, they were actually not that bad. So an economy that grows at 1% or contracts by 1%, I personally don't see that much of a difference. It's anemic growth. There is some unemployment. Uh, there's not much uh, impetus to, for wages to grow because the economy is not doing very well. Plus one, minus one to me is not that qualitatively different, but we use that very strict definition of quarter on quarter, subsequent two quarters of decline in activity to call it a recession. But I would say the interest rate hike and ensuing recession in the late 80s uh, or early 90s as well as in the early 2000s were also not that big a deal. I would not call those as massive hard landing either. Uh, let's take the last question, and this is actually a very deep question. I don't think I can do justice to that in the 30 seconds that I have left. And the question is, how do you see the confluence of fiscal consolidation with balance sheet adjustment of central bank on net supply of long bonds in the market? Of course, it supports the long bond. If fiscal consolidation means led issuance, and if central bank support uh, being withdrawn means you know, less support for that, Net net, it still should be positive for bonds because it's not a backstop from the central bank, but supply is going down and there should be buyers of the safe asset. Um, so I think the pace of fiscal consolidation is not bad at all. Uh, you don't want it to kill the system. It's happening fairly rapidly uh, and, and they will continue to happen in the coming years. And with fairly high above trend inflation, some of the debt would also get inflated away. That's good news. So the bottom line is the macro dynamic independent of the financial stability concerns that we have right now, overall microdynamic is good. We have upside surprise to growth accumulating. We have supply state normalization, chain normalization proceeding uh, in a fairly orderly manner. You heard from TEing, there's actually too much of certain electronics products out in the world. That's good news. We want too much, we want an abundance. If that means some short-term profit issue for companies, so be it, but the world needs more supply right now, not less, so that can actually support overall industrial structure and demand side dynamic. With that, we'll end. Thanks to the viewers in LinkedIn and YouTube and to our loyal followers of DBS Macro Insights live stream. We'll come back to you in April. Send us some feedback, how you liked it, and uh, we will uh, take those into account. Take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy.